Welcome to AP Biology Unit 6. This is Gene Expression and Regulation. In this first video, we are going to look at an introduction to the unit and DNA and RNA. So to start our look at gene expression and gene expression regulation, let's just talk about what gene expression is. So at the top, we see a representation of DNA and a couple of genes. What do we do with those? What are the first and second steps of gene expression? The first step of gene expression is transcription, where DNA is turned into RNA. And then the second step is where RNA is turned into protein. Now note that not all DNA turns into protein eventually, that some um, RNA has functions of its own. So in some cases there's transcription of genes and um, that RNA won't be translated. The process of going from DNA to RNA to protein is also referred to as the central dogma. This is just so critical to understanding biology, understanding genetics, um, that it gets a special name. Um, but when we talk about central dogma, or we talk about gene expression, generally what we're referring to is DNA to RNA to protein of transcription and translation. So to put this in context of sort of why this uh, matters, um, one reason why this matters is that there are lots of different cells in multicellular organisms. So something to understand that we'll go into later um, in more detail is what cell differentiation is. So see if you can define this. What is cell differentiation? Cell differentiation is the process of one type of cell changing into a different type of cell. Usually that means a change from a less specialized cell, like a stem cell, to one that is more specialized. And you can see a lot of examples here. Now let's imagine all of these cells are in one person's body. How were all of these cells produced? So how did we get from that stem cell to all of these different cells? Um, and a follow-up to that is, do they all have the same DNA? So all of the somatic cells were produced by mitosis and have identical DNA. So when we go from the stem cell to muscle, fat, bone, blood, nervous, epithelial, immune, this happens through mitosis and there is identical DNA there. Gametes though, those sex cells are different. These are produced by meiosis and they just have half of the DNA compared to other cells. So a follow-up question to this is if all of these somatic cells have the same DNA, how is it possible that the cells are different from one another? If all of them have the same instructions, how is it possible that they end up so different? And this is where gene regulation comes in. So see if you can figure out the answer to this question. If somatic cells all have the same DNA, what makes them different? And use this diagram to try to figure that out. So the key here is even though somatic cells have an entire set of genes, not all of the genes are expressed in all cell types or at all times. So on the left, we can see a liver cell um, is uh, expressing the alcohol dehydrogenase gene. It is not expressing this particular neurotransmitter gene. Whereas in the neurotransmitter, or I should say in the neuron over on the right, um, this is not expressing the alcohol dehydrogenase gene, but it is expressing the neurotransmitter gene. So now we're going to jump from an overview into some specifics about nucleic acids. So I know you have a little background on nucleic acids. Let's see what you remember. What are the two types of nucleic acids? What are the monomers of nucleic acids? And what components make up those monomers? And we covered these in earlier in this year. The two types of nucleic acids are RNA and DNA. The monomers of those nucleic acids are nucleotides, and the components of those monomers are a phosphate group, a five-carbon sugar, and a nitrogenous base. So if we were going to draw out a generalized nucleotide of DNA, we would need all of those components. How do those fit together? So on one side, you have the phosphate group. In the center, you have the sugar. And on the other side, you have the nitrogenous base. So a couple of things to notice here, and you don't have to be able to draw this in um, perfect detail with all of the um, proper elements in exactly the right spots, but you should know generally the phosphate group is connected to the um, five carbon sugar, which is connected to the nitrogenous base. 
Um, something else to note is the um, five carbons in that five carbon sugar are numbered and they're numbered starting at the base. So the first carbon, which is shown with a red number one here, is attached to that nitrogenous base. Then we go around and label the rest of the carbons in a circle. So moving to two, three, four, and five. And that fifth carbon is connected to the phosphate group. This numbering system is really important later. So for now, I want you to notice that that fifth carbon attaches to the phosphate. So this nitrogenous base in this example nucleotide is adenine. What are the other bases and what are some ways in which the bases differ? The other nitrogenous bases other than adenine are cytosine, uracil, thiamine, and guanine. So one of the ways they differ is in how many rings they have. Three of these nitrogenous bases, C, U, and T, are called pyrimidines and only have one ring. So they're slightly smaller. Two of them, G and A, have two rings, and these are called purines. Um, the bases also differ um, in the exact chemical makeup of them, but that's beyond the scope of this class. You should, though, be aware of this single ring, double ring structure. All right, let's take a look over on the left and see um, what else we can see about this basic structure. So again, we've got our phosphate group, our five carbon sugar, and nitrogenous base. So in addition to our bases differing, the sugars also differ. So if you look on the bottom left there, you can see two different types of five carbon sugars. On the left, you see ribose, which is in RNA, and on the right, you see deoxyribose, which is in DNA. And that's where the R in RNA and the D in DNA come from, is which five carbon sugar is at the center of their nucleotides. So DNA and RNAs, we just saw, differ in their sugars and in which bases they have. So um, both DNA and RNA have C, G, and A, but in RNA we have U, and in um, DNA we have thiamine. But they, they also differ, or at least commonly differ, in um, at least one other way. What is that? So commonly, usually but not always, DNA is most often double-stranded and RNA is most often single-stranded. There are absolutely exceptions to that, so that shouldn't be used as the rule. Um, the defining features of DNA versus RNA are the types of bases as well as the type of sugar in the nucleotide. Um, but you can often find DNA in double-stranded and RNA as single-stranded. Okay, so let's do another review back to biochemistry and remember what is the name of the process that connects monomers into a polymer. So remember the monomer we're talking about here are nucleotides and we're trying to build this into the polymer of nucleic acids, either RNA or, or DNA. What process um, connects those two monomers? That's called dehydration synthesis. So where we have multiple monomers coming together and we lose a water molecule and through the process we get a covalent bond. And so now instead of two molecules, we um, have one larger molecule. And if you do that enough, you get a really long strand. All right, so now that we know the basics of what nucleic acids are, let's talk about where we find them. So nucleic acids can be found in viruses, prokaryotes, and eukaryotes. So let's talk about the differences between those. Viruses are actually non-living um, entities. Um, prokaryotes, um, if for example, bacteria, um, are um, pictured in the middle there. Those are uh, single-celled organisms. And then uh, eukaryotes can be single-celled or multicellular, but include protists, fungi, animals, and plants. Um, so this is a chart sort of comparing these three different categories in terms of nucleic acid location um, and multiple other um, components. Um, you should be vaguely familiar with, with some of these components, although I don't want to spend too much time going over these. There are wonderful videos comparing these three um, categories, or you can certainly read in your textbook, um, but I wanted to give you just a little bit of background here. What I do want to focus on, though, is that nucleic acids are in all living things. So what does that imply, that nucleic acids are in all living things? So this implies a common ancestry. So we can see in this chart that there are certainly differences in um, nucleic acid location, the types of nucleic acid, um, replication rate, other factors do differ between viruses, prokaryotes, and eukaryotes, but the fact that they all share a common language 
points to common ancestry in all of those. I'd also like to point out one more time that viruses are considered non-living, and that's because they can only replicate in a host, as opposed to prokaryotes and eukaryotes that are living organisms. All right, so let's go on and uh, dive a little bit deeper into types of RNA, and then we'll also look at DNA in more detail. So RNA has lots of functions besides being the genetic code in many viruses. Um, three main types of RNA in eukaryotes are mRNA, rRNA, and tRNA. What are each of those? So what does mRNA stand for, rRNA, and tRNA, and what do they do? mRNA is messenger RNA, and that's used as a template to make proteins. Um, that's where the DNA gets transcribed into the messenger RNA, and then the RNA uh, or the messenger RNA will be translated into the protein. rRNA is ribosomal RNA, and that's an important component of ribosomes, and ribosomes is where protein synthesis happens. That's where translation happens tRNA is called transfer RNA, and that is an important component of the translation process. We'll come back to this later, but uh, tRNA uses mRNA as a template to bring in the correct amino acid to the growing polypeptide chain. So now let's dig in a little bit to DNA. On the right, you can see a diagram of DNA, and you can see the rungs going across the center, if you can imagine this like a ladder, rungs going across the center, and then um, the backbone on the left and right. So what components of the nucleotide make up that backbone? So the rungs are the nitrogenous bases, and you can see those are the colorful ones in the middle, and the backbone is the sugar and phosphate. Next question is, how many molecules are we seeing here? Um, I'll give you a clue. It's more than one. How many molecules do we see? And then what is the intermolecular, intermolecular force that keeps those separate molecules together? So there are two molecules shown here. There's the molecule on the left and the molecule on the right. Um, and these are in strands. So we have a strand on the left and a strand on the right. And what's, what is holding together these two molecules are the hydrogen bonds shown in between the bases. So for example, at the top there, the connection between the bases of A and T, those are hydrogen bonds holding that together. And it's those hydrogen bonds that hold those two molecules of DNA together. So looking at this diagram, let's do a diagram interpretation. What do you think the relative force of attraction would be between a CG pair and an AT pair, and why? There's a stronger attraction between the CG pair than between the AT because there are more hydrogen bonds there. And you can see this in the diagram as the number of connections. So between A and T, we see two, and between C and G, we see three. So if there are more hydrogen bonds, that's a tighter force pulling those together. All right, next question is looking at the directionality of DNA. We often talk about DNA being directional, and there are th three prime ends and five prime ends of DNA, or each strand, I should say, has a three prime and five prime end. So which end is which, first of all? And then secondly, what does it mean that the strands run anti-parallel? So if you remember back when we were numbering our pentose sugar, our five carbon sugar, that fifth carbon is attached to the phosphate group. That's what that five prime means, is this is the phosphate end. This will become really important um, as, uh, as we go on. So when we start talking about DNA replication and transcription, knowing directionality is going to become critical. So be paying attention to that phosphate end is the five. You can think about it five for phosphate. And then the other end is the three prime end. And that's where that third carbon is in the pentose sugar. Um, and there's a hydroxyl group pointing on that end. And in terms of what anti-parallel means, it's that the two strands are running in opposite directions. So if you look at this diagram, you'll see five prime um, is at the top on the left, and it runs down to three prime on the, on the lower left. And then that opposite strand, the strand on the right, runs top to bottom from three to five. So one strand runs five to three as you look from top to bottom, and the other strand runs three to five. Next question about DNA I have for you is that DNA is charged. What is its charge? Do you think it's positive or negative, and why? So this comes back to the components of the nucleotide as well. That phosphate group has a negative charge, and that gives DNA as a whole a negative charge. So because DNA is charged, do you think that means that DNA is hydrophobic or hydrophilic? 
Because it has a charge, DNA is hydrophilic. That means it can form hydrogen bonds with water. All right, now this slide, there's a whole lot going on. Um, we may or may not talk in class about different classic studies that helped us understand um, DNA and RNA and sort of the importance and the structure of each of those. So if we have gone over these in class, this would be a chance for you to review. Is of each of these studies, what was the finding? If we haven't gone over these in class, don't worry about it. So as I just said, if we haven't gone over these in class, don't worry about it. But on this slide, you can see a very basic summary of what each of these studies found. All right, the last bit of this unit, of um, unit 6.1, where we're looking at DNA and RNA, is the concept of DNA packaging. So how is it all packaged up, put together, organized? Um, some terms that you need to be aware of in this um, concept are the terms DNA helix, histone, and chromatin. See if you can define any of those and use this diagram to help you. A DNA helix is the spiraling shape of the DNA molecule. Um, and when you're referring to both strands, you refer to it as a double helix. So before, when we were showing sort of that ladder structure, we were just looking at kind of a, a 2D look at it. But when DNA um, is a 3D object, it becomes a spiral shape. And that's what that helix is referring to. Histones are a type of protein, and DNA wraps around this. Um, we'll talk more about the importance of histones, um, but one is just that it keeps the it, it keeps it from getting all tangled up. Um, how wound up it is is also going to be important later. And then chromatin, the term chromatin, is simply the combination of DNA and histones. So during interphase, chromatin is kept fairly loose. When and why would this chromatin condense? So chromatin condenses into a tightly packed chromosome during prophase of either mitosis or meiosis, and that makes it easier to separate out the genetic material. If it's tightly wound up, um, it's all kind of in one place, it's easier to separate. So note that the chromosome pictured at the top left is shown in its condensed duplicated state. And that's how we often see chromosomes. But just be aware that that's not always how our genetic material um, is, is packaged. It's often in a much looser, sort of more spaghetti-like um, packaging. So that's where we'll leave it off for today. And the next video, we'll do 6.2 in DNA replication.